Welcome back to Tyranny. So as promised, I went back to the tower. I trained, and now I'm back. I'll tell you what, fast mode definitely is nice for backtracking. I'll show you just how much faster it is. This is fast mode. And then regular mode. Probably feel like for exploring new areas, I'll probably just still do regular mode. Because in fast mode, I think the animations because they're so split up, they look kind of unnatural. It looks kind of herky-jerky. But for going back through places you've been to before, it definitely makes life uh, a lot easier because it's so much quicker. But enough about that. Let's go into the silent archive and find out Please just what it's all about. Shadow. So that goes to another screen. Before I do that, maybe that's the um, exit, the secret to that secret passageway that was blocked off before. Maybe the barrier is now down. spinning there is it's obviously going to be powerful. Hey, is that a uh, fifth eye? No, it's a sensor. Well, I assumed it would be you who would emerge as the victor in this game. I must say I'm a little disappointed you were able to dispatch all my men so readily. The fear of death is such a great motivator, but causing death seems to motivate you a little more. I guess I'll have to show a more discerning eye in my recruiting. Though I suppose it's a little too soon to celebrate, you have yet to retrieve the silent archive. She looks across the pools of lava at the platform and shakes her head. The intensity of the magic it must have taken to ensure the preservation of that scroll. It's rather amusing if you think about it. They may have stopped the building from collapsing, but they couldn't stop the edict or the scarlet chorus. All they did was sacrifice themselves for a scrap of parchment they're going to lose anyway. You won the game, Fatebinder. Far be it for me to take the glory away from you. She holds out her hand, motioning to the silent archive. Claim the prize. I intend to. Cut the banter and stay low. Kills in shadow understands. here is flecked with small bits of obsidian. And one larger piece juts out from the wall and looks like it could be removed. Take it. Would you take a look at that? Why yes, I will take a look at that. Chronicler's Eye. Plus 10 lore, plus 10% will defense. Ooh. I think I want to give this to Ed. Get rid of this battle one torque. Give it to uh, Kills and Shadow. This item can only be. This item can only be equipped by Lantry. Uh, well, dicks. Stop. 
Staff of Horus. Um, greater DPS. It only has one modifier instead of two. It has Distortion. Passive. Plus 50% Grace Deflection. Plus 50% Hit Deflection. Oh, it's an artifact. Artifact ability, slowing the sands. Dramatically slows enemies in the targeted area. These effects scale with the staff of horses we're now. Wow. Well, in that case, I'm definitely going to give this to her. Power is increased. You require staff of horses. Looks for wits. Is this a permanent plus one? Let's see. One way to find out, right? Soldiers and scholars alike drink the elixir of wits to heighten their mental acuity and sense of observation. Scouts can ensure that they don't miss critical detail on a mission. And academics can capture the subject of even the most enigmatic tones of lore. Some imbibers have complained of senses sharpened beyond any desired capacity, but a few dozen outliers shouldn't cast a shadow over pro proven results. I don't think it's permanent because it would be worth a hell of a lot more than 20 copper rings. These lesser healing potions are worth the same amount, so I think it's a temporary effect. So I'll use it when I need it. Nope, we're not. It's as far as I'm going this way, huh? The bodies of sages who gave their lives to stop the library's collapse of litter around the central pedestal. First sage, Arwell's directives. Kairos' armies have been rebuffed for now, but it's only a temporary victory. I have no doubt that we may hold these walls a good deal longer. But you must remember that the Overlord aims not to butcher the Citadel's keepers, but to destroy its secrets. Kairos is not omnipotent. Her powers may be known and understood in time, and she rightly fears the knowledge we hoard here. The Silent Archive must be protected. There is no library in the tears that is its equal. Nothing else matters. Nothing. We may not know the Overlord's plans, but with time and research, we can circumvent any of our deeds, designs. I need to ensure that we will have that time when this moment is right. Focus your efforts on the sage Setia's theoretical forays into temporal magic. While we are right to deny such dangerous experimentation before, now, it is now is the time in which its risks are justified. Gather the elder sages and your way to the and make your way to the lower chambers. You will remain there until you will devise a solution to stay as problem of scale. Halting the flow of time in a single chamber won't be sufficient if Kairos drowns all of us in a storm or, in a storm or hurdles this library into a firmament. You must find a way to encase all of the citadel in such a spell should disaster come. Your success is an option. This library will be a distant memory if Kairos has a way. Should we both survive, I will be happy to congratulate you on your breakthrough. Until then, get to work. Sage Torben's notes. Sage Litotes, 
can't help you with the ringing in your ears just yet. So we'll have to make do until the conflict is over. Yes, our will was very explicit in our directives. I know they seem impossible, but that is the situation we face. Everyone that could interpret the silent archive died in the last night's attack. So we're not getting any assistance in the matter. Thankfully, I do have an idea, one which requires everyone's participation. Scale is the issue. Setia's last experiment only affected as much as a small chamber. I believe that we can amplify the spell's effects by repeating the motions of its, sigil, of its sigils as a group, similar to the ritual magic used in primitive cultures that predated modern tearsmen. Sage dangling par participle believes that this will create an exponential growth in the spell's effects, but at an expected cost of stability. I'm inclined to agree. Also, we have no other ideas. No one else has your expertise in magical foci. You've told me countless times how minor baubles can have a perfect leveling effect on spells that exceed the control of their casters. What if we use something as powerful as an artifact as the focus of the ritual? Without one, the energies involved will quickly become chaotic and almost assured to be deadly for all of us. At least with an artifact, there's a chance that Stea's spell will encompass the entire citadel and put it into a state of stasis. In my opinion, there's only one artifact to use, and that's the Silent Archive itself. It's clearly the most potent object in this room. Sage Danglin Participle believes that the Staff of Horus will suffice, but I'm not going to leave anything to chance. Better that we use the Silent Archive as our focus now and figure out how to safely retrieve it later. Not if you agree after reading this. I really hope that blast didn't take your sight as well. Sage Torbo. Uh, nothing else to loot here, right? Alright. Examine the scroll. Take a closer look at the silent archive. Move the scroll and replace it with one of your artifacts to keep the protected magics from ending. A nimbus of magical energy surrounds this scroll, which levitates above the central platform. You see characters upon the parchment, but they seem to shift from one language to the next. I've heard of manuscripts exhibiting behavior like this, but only ones that were ever that were imbued with extraordinary arcane energy. This has to be the silent archive. The motions of the characters on the scroll surface slows as you approach, seemingly in response to your presence. Waves of energy radiate out from the scroll, billowing up toward the ceiling and fanning out to encompass the cavernous chamber. It appears that the silent archive is an active participant in some sort of ongoing spell, one that is likely keeping the burning library standing. Removing the scroll would assuredly have disastrous effects upon the active spell. This must be the time space of spell referenced in Sage Arwell's letter. Judging by the bodies arrayed around the silent archive, the mages appear to have been successful in their attempts to halt the destruction of Paris's Eden though they did not survive the process. Litote's experiments with foci clearly paid off. The spell protecting the burning library is operating at a massive scale. Its chaotic energy is currently stabilized by the silent archive itself. Its underlying mechanism is familiar to you. It seems likely that any artifact of sufficient power could serve as the spell's focus. Should the need arise, you believe you could swap the Silent Archive for another item of power without disrupting the ongoing temporal magic. So I have to put that Staff of Horus in there? Can I just leave this and say, screw it, let the library be destroyed? The parchment surface is impossible to read. Ever shifting and convoluted, you see characters from Old Burden written all over the calligraphy of the Northern Empire, which transforms into words used by nomadic tribes of ancient Azure, and then again at the phrases of the common tongues of the tears. What are you? A 
As you utter the question, the scroll surface is suddenly wiped clear. After a moment, words begin to form on the page. Indeed, the silent archive is meant to be the final source of knowledge. Every text we have magically transcribed bubbles beneath its surface, waiting to be called forth. First scribe, Gaynor, Sage, Archival Methodologies, Methodologies, Volume 8. Every text, to condense the library's collective works into a single scroll, or expression beams with wonder. That is an ingenious, if dangerous undertaking. The passage fades away, only to be replaced by another. The Silent Archive is the 100-year endeavor of the School of Quill and Ink. As one of its creators and guardians, I have ensured that its knowledge may only be accessed by the sages of my order, and only those specifically charged with such weighty responsibility. The Silent Archive is, thus, a glittering jewel that only a few may see. Should the artifact fall into outsider hands, I expect that less than one in a hundred of its secrets will be revealed in the span of a lifetime. So if I just take it, this place is going to collapse, which I don't care about if I can get out of time. You reach out to touch the scroll, but as soon as your hand passes through the cloud encasing it, a violent tremor erupts in the hall. The shaking continues for a few seconds, then vanishes. We already know the scroll is more than it seems. Perhaps we should proceed with caution. I have the feeling that we are nudging something very old and fragile out of place and risk bringing the roof down on our heads. That's what I'm worried about. So I'm gonna save my game. I really don't want to give up the stack of horse because that thing is awesome. Let's take it. Worst case scenario, we die and then I swap the artifact. You seem awfully confident that the library won't collapse and bury us all. Go for it then. Satisfy the edict, and once the library is destroyed, the edict shall stop, right? Which I kind of like. I'm trying to do that. Sweet, I made it out. Wasn't that fun? All those dead sages stealing from them, killing the chorus. Ah, oh, we'll always have that blinks, our eyebrows rises. Shouldn't the edict be over? We did everything collect correctly, right? No, I think the silent archive has to be destroyed, too. The air surrounding you begins to thin, and the smell of embers begins to diminish. Clouds of smoke slowly revealing the sky beyond the hole. Maybe it did end it. Oh yeah, I'm powering up! Feel a powerful pulse of warm energy burst from the silent archive. Sound disappears into a deafening silence. Your vision blurs, and you are overcome by a dizziness that nearly knocks you off your feet. Then, as quickly as it hits you, the feeling passes. The air around you begins to settle, and the particles of fire and ash that moments ago stung your eyes dissipate with a chilly gust. With the silent archive removed from the burning library, the edict of fire is extinguished, and its warmth feels pulled into your very chest, a sensation similar to the weightlessness. Similar to the weightlessness when the edict of execution broke at Ascension Hall. While I'm all in favor of undoing the Overlord's magic, the whole edict of fire couldn't have happened to a shittier gaggle of scum suckers. Still, the fires could have spread elsewhere in time, so you did the right thing. Reeks of ash and rotting trees. It hurts to breathe. I do love watching someone's hard work unravel like an old sweater. If you ever meet Kairos, ask how long it took to draft the edict of fire. The shape and intensity of the fires leap in your mind. The details of the mighty incantation 
the words, the magical logic of the flames, all are seared in your mind with perfect recall. The edict of fire is now a part of you. And here comes the sensor. No, no, uh, no doubt here to take the silent archive. The party has received scroll sigil of channel strength. Nice. You have proven yourself to be the true winner of this game, Fake Finder. Without your help in the library, my men would surely have ended up killing themselves in one way or another. I am not such a fool as to ask you to turn over the silent archive. If the voice has asked you to retrieve it personally, I will leave it to you to give it to him. I am more than happy to remain here. Out of his gaze. I wonder if I had replaced it with the staff of Horus. If maybe the lava would have receded and there would have been other areas in the um, library for me to go and maybe loot. I guess that's uh, something for me to check in another playthrough. Maybe when I try to do a good playthrough in the future and save everybody and be, uh, you know, Ooh, everybody lives. But that's not this time. So you probably won't appreciate hearing the libraries and ruins now. I'm afraid I might be taking the brunt of that one. So if you keep your mouth shut, shut about it, so will I. Hey, if he doesn't ask specifically. I don't know what Kairos will do after finding out you ended the edict, but that's a matter for you to deal with, isn't it? She laughs like she just told the joke. I suppose destroying the library is a point in your favor in that court. Look on the bright side, she laughs again. I do ask one thing, though. She steps closer and you can hear here, her breathing has quickened. Can I hold the silent archive just once? All that fuss spent retrieving it, I want to be able to say, say I held it in my hands. Of course. The sensor's giggling takes on a manic tone, and her breathing borders on hyperventilating as you place the scroll in her hands. As the vellum touches her hands, there is a flash brighter than the one you saw before and she makes an orgasmic noise, almost dropping the sound around her. Such power, she whispers the words of all. Now give it back. Of course, she hands you the silent archive. That was all I wanted. Tell the rat I said the mission was a success. Now that you have the information from the silent archive, you can tell him yourself. He wants both of us to report to him. The sensor looks around as if she's trying to find someone to save her. Under her breath, you can hear her whisper, You fool. You had to know this was coming. Then she shakes her head. Fake binder, I wouldn't dream of taking that honor from you. By all means, you're more than welcome to tell him. I insist, this is what you wanted, isn't it? And the rat gets to keep all the information from the silent archive, and he asked for you personally. The sensor's entire countenance falls, and she rocks back and forth on her heels, looking as if she's trying to shy away from your words. He, what? She's silent for a moment, then continues a false, happy tone to her voice. Well, then, I could use a change of scenery. Her eyes have practically melted from watching lava flow. My eyes have practically melted from watching lava flow. She looks down. Farewell, Fate Binder. It's now a finality to her tone. I hope to see you back at the cacophony. Do I, I still have the silent archive, right? Yes, I do. Plus one wits, plus one the resolve, plus one, plus ten track connection. Nice. Before I give that silent archive to um, Voices of the Rat, I'm going to go talk to Lantry and see if he can decipher it. Because I'd like to learn some of the things in it myself.
so first things first, back to the spire we go. Oh, and that's Staff of Horus. Yeah. There we go. Would you mind taking a look at something for me? <gasps> That's twice now. By Kairos's icy nethers. Twice! Edicts have been broken before, but never in all my many years have I heard of one person doing it twice. Struck and write this down for future generations. Uh, of course, I, I was mainly <laughs> making an observation. Lantry lowers his head, turning his focus then furiously scribbling along a curling sheet of parchment. So, what's on your mind? Did you want to discuss matters of the present, or would you prefer a more scholarly rant? Let us discuss current matters. Of course. How can I help? You're taking lots of notes. What about? Mm, all kinds of things. My mind is old. Memories are sieve. Keeping track of you. Uh, noting what I hear of the war. Scribbling down reminders to myself. That sort of thing. Is it safe to be writing on your arms that much? No, oh, certainly not. But it depends on the ink I'm using. Too much cerulean and I can't sleep. But just the right amount, and I can write all night. The red ink will give you swamp bottom if you drink it, but absorbed through the skin, it'll make you taste colors and smell music. Uh, speaking of which, I should change out my tip. I use three kinds, sepia, cerulean, and a red that's never the same shade. My recipe needs work. I like having three colors, but they also provide different um, states of mind for writing. I am nothing if not a semi-reliable font of knowledge. Uh, what did you want to discuss? And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. Hmm. Is there... It doesn't look like there's a way to get him to talk about the... Um... To have him read the... Silent Archive. You know the spires. History used to say that the older realms built the spires. These days you'll hear children repeating that Kairos built them. Guess that's the new history? There are spires all over Teratus, though I don't know the count. Maybe 40 or so? Five of them are in the tiers, and generally the spires follow the old walls, often occurring at junctions in the old masonry. The mountain spire is a notable exception. The other spires in the tiers connect to the old walls, but the mountain spire is just freestanding. A sore thumb in the middle of the tiers. Any ideas to their purpose? Lightning rod? Perch from which to survey the lands below? Signpost for a society of folks that 
flew like birds. On this matter, I have only conjecture. Flights of fancy. The best hypothesis I've heard is that they were all built as at the sites of major settlements now long gone. So maybe their haphazard placement is a hint about how the maps of old might have looked. Any idea why magic works better near the spires? The sages liken the phenomenon to heat radiating from a candle. The air is just thicker with magic the closer you get to the spire. It could be deadly trying to work spells close to a spire if you aren't wise to the effect. I'd be famous if I could tell you why this happened. I've always assumed that there are magic equivalents. They are the magic equivalent of river sources. Just as water endlessly flows from certain special sites, so too are there places where magic pours endlessly from a natural source. Any idea who built the structure on top of the mountain spire? Know any sculptors with superhuman strength have the power to fly? If not, I'm out of ideas. Structurally speaking, it looks vaguely, and I do mean vaguely, similar to the sculptures in the old Academy of Tides. But if that were the case, I think we'd know more. I also noticed the resemblance, but I can assure you, if it was built by any old tide caster, it was the best kept secret in a school that prides itself on showmanship and boasting about your exploits. Oh, so you studied the art of being insufferable, and here I thought it was a natural gift. <laughs> the symbols on the structure certainly look like they could be related to the symbols found in the old walls. So I'm all but certain that the structure was built by the same craftsman that built the spire. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. Spellcraft. <laughs> I've forgotten more than most blood chanters have ever learned. What do you want to know? Can you teach me anything? Most certainly. Uh, I probably should have shown you how to mend wounds sooner. If you have a moment, I can show you the healing sigil I was trained to use. Yes, please. Rummaging through a satchel, the sage produces a long quill and a crumpled piece of parchment. With seven quick strokes of the quill, he inks a pattern on the page. We'll start with the first principles. When mending wounds at ease in pain, we invoke the magic of the orphan midwife, Archon of Rebirth. By invoking her sigil, we channel her mastery, hovering briefly through the, our hands. Now trace the sigil, following the lines in the order I sketched them. Since this isn't your first cantrip, I'll move a little quickly. I'll move a little quickly, but I think you can keep up. I actually walks you through countless repetitions of the signing of Mystic Sigil. For hours, you wave your hand in the air to no effect, until at last, you sign the pattern in the air and feel a rush of power through your veins. Nice. And so, if you need to heal pain as opposed to purge an infection, you'd move your hand like so, but you know, that's enough for now, I think the rest you can figure out on your own. What sort of magic did the sages teach you? Sage Sindon tutored me in the traditional sigils, those of preservation, concealment, and healing, as derived from the bygone archons of Tharavis, Fading Wrath, and the Orphan Midwife. Preservation magic is largely functional, sealing parchment, binding books, that sort of thing. All of us chroniclers learn the concealment magic, as our ideal method would be to study events without contaminating the decisions being made. As for the healing magic, many of us modern sages study this a great deal. The school has a shoddy reputation among the common folk. I figure if they knew us as healers and caregivers, maybe we start to change opinions. That's a noble craft to study. True, but given how accident prone I can be, I think the person that benefits most from my magic is me. But certainly the most gr gratifying spells I know are the ones that ease pain and suffering. 
they make me feel slightly useful. What can you tell me about signing magic? Scholars don't have a good word for that. Archons do when they cast magic. Couldn't tell you how Graven Ash, Ash casts his protection over his soldiers. Nor would I want to know how Blood and Mark consciously decides to move through a shadow. But when us mere mages want to cast a spell, we do so by signing the sigil of an Archon that previously discovered a magical phenomenon in question. It's debated whether Archons create new magic or just discover magic that was waiting for us. But such questions seem impossible to answer while sober. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom... Familiar is a relative term. I think I know more than most, but it's a subject of mystery, even to the scholars. Though, I must admit, in addition to my reading, I ventured into the old walls on occasion, and soiled many undergarments in the process. <laughs> uh. Do you know who built them? Or why? We can only seem to agree that they were built. There's no consensus as to the who of it. We generally use the old realms or older realms when describing the folk that must have done all this construction ages ago. That's also where the young realms got their name, indirectly. Azure, stalwart, and all of them are older than you and I, but compared to the old walls, they're babies. As for the why, that's anybody's guess. I've always assumed that it's an ancient road and aqueduct network if you just need to fence. If you just need to fence up your neighbors, you wouldn't have such elaborate, expansive, expansive masonry on the inside. What sort of things have you seen in the old walls? Aside from the terrifying pain, well, every section of the old walls has its own jaw, drop, own jaw-dropping architecture. I've seen bridges that move when someone is near, mystical barriers that must have been standing for eons. And I've seen remains, so many remains, a lot of them sages from centuries past, or hapless drifters that must have been desperate for shelter. What fascinates me most are the symbols found in the interior architecture. I can't help but think if we shared notes with the other old world explorers, we might someday decipher the meaning. Arrows forbids exploration of the old walls, but the Tearsmen have similar laws. In typical younger realms fashion, entering the old walls was never illegal but plundering them was. The logic being that which rests in the old walls belongs to your local ruler, not you. The noble houses made a point of buying up anything that came out of the old walls. Plenty of ancient stuff in there, but sometimes you find stuff that's just a generation old, left by the last fool trying to search for treasure. If you've been through the old walls, you must be familiar with the vein. More so than is healthy, I've seen one rip a young scribe in half with its nebulous talents, and I've run away from more than my fair share of angry pain. That sounds redundant, they all seem angry. Heard all sorts of theories on the vein. Heard that they were dead mages, the nightmares of archons come to life. One sage believes they're Kairos' children. Guess if you have enough ink and parchment, you can crap out any dumb idea. I profess to know very little and stick to what can be observed. They appear cunning, but lacking language, and they have animal-like qualities, but they seem drawn only to magic and emotion. Food and water seem irrelevant to them. And I'd be happy to oblige, ever since the- What do you know of Kairos' edicts? Kairos has cast many over the ages, and to my knowledge has never worded two edicts exactly the same. Edicts defy our understanding of magic. Kairos' magic works over vast distances, over infinite durations, and no Archon or near mage can counter the force of an edict. I explain it to my students like this. Spell is to an edict as a drop of rain is to a hurricane. Edicts and spells are both magical cantrips, but differ in intensity by orders of magnitude. 
edicts are almost commands to terrorists that must be carried out until the instructions allow for the magic to end. If Kairos wants a plague until the next Judges Day, expect copious buboes until the next Judges Day. Nothing has ever dispelled an edict. Nothing outside of the edict's own sun, sunset clause, as I like to think of that. The Edict of Stone ravages the realm of Azure. The upheaval of earth and rock turned the Roman plains into a craggy step known as the Stone Sea. Since the Edict was directed at the traitorous Archon of Stone, it would seem the upheaval of Azure was a secondary consequence, though I imagine little of what Kairos does is unintentional. Of course, that's the way. I was there when the ground erupted with fire, and I don't think I remember ever being as terrified as I was that day. If I hadn't woken early, I'd have likely perished in my sleep or awoken to the experience of being immolated. I have very conflicted feelings about the matter. The School of Ink and Quo had every opportunity to surrender. The leadership chose to stand against the most powerful force on Teratus. While this is all very terrible, it was entirely preventable. You think me crazy, but there's a part of me saddened I lived through an edict of fire. Kairos has used this before. I figure if I'm going to have years taken off my life, fleeing an edict would have been nice if it was a historical first. I think you know more about I think you know more than most on the subject. I watched with great interest when it happened but fleeing the Edict of Fire was a more pressing concern. The Edict of Storms turned the once forested lands of Stalwart into a windswept wasteland. They call it the Blade Great now, since only the iron and bro bronze armaments remain. Hurricane breezes, rust winds, and relentless lightning have destroyed the housing and farmlands. It seems like the Archons were about to kill each other, and the threat of mutual destruction was about all Kairos had left. I imagine fear is the only way to get someone like the Voices of the Rat to follow orders. And the Edict certainly did whip them into action. Do Edicts work on the same arcane principles as the spellcraft and other magic? Edicts are the strongest manifestation of magic we know, and they seem to violate all other lesser phenomena. No dispel cantrip has ever dented or abated an edict. Even archons with powers of great durability cannot shrug off their effects. Uh, just look at Cairn. Now, what I find curious, edicts can flex a little. Or so my study suggests this is the case. Take the Edict of Storms. While the day it was proclaimed was the most violent, the actual radius of the storm has changed over time. Uh, but most will have none of my hypotheses on this matter. Fine, I'll take the bait. What's your conjecture about edicts? So, in my studies, some edicts resolve some problem of the overlords and then vanish into history. But the edicts that linger around, almost all of them begin to widen. Their effects become more intense. Here's the intriguing part. The older the edict, and the more that's written about it, the more the reports of that edict get more dire over time. That's how legends work. Each generation tells them bigger. True, I could just be overreacting to sloppy record keeping, but my hunch is that there's some correlation going on here. Maybe the renown of the edict amplifies its power. I contend that edicts are powered by fear. Fear of Kairos helps fuel the casting, and fear of the edict feeds the magic, sustaining it, and if enough people fear it, even growing it a bit. Basically what I said. Rule by fear is certainly Kairos' way. Intellectual honesty demands that I study the matter more. 
If I'm correct, the more people fear and obsess over an edict, the stronger it becomes. Anyway, another study for another time. And I'd be happy to oblige, ever since the fall of... I've studied many of the Archons for many years. Compared to the other sages, I'm an expert on the subject, which is sad because I feel I've studied, I've still so much to learn. How does the magic of the Archons work? The Archons all have magical powers that are intuitive. When the voices in the rap pulls out someone's mind or a graven ash protects his soldiers, that magic isn't a signed spell or a ritual. To them, it's closer to flexing one's hand. Archons are the, what's the word for it? Axiom of magic, the root of magic. Spell pioneers? I'm sure this analogy is off in many ways, but I see Archons as the mothers of original magic, and everyone else is just imitating them. To confuse things a bit, some Archons learn to cast other spells in the same fashion as us lesser mages. If you are as important as an Archon, you learn quickly that all knowledge is power. Are all the Archons loyal to Kairos? Officially, yes. In actuality, no. Those with the true gift of magic always come to the attention of Kairos. A few manage to evade attention for a bit. The School of Tides was founded by one such uncontrollable, but these are history's exceptions. Occulted Jade, Archon of Tides, never bowed to Kairos and it's said she survived the assassins sent to silence her. It makes her flight from Kairos before the war all the more troubling. We knew her as the symbol of strength, but when threatened, her weaker nature won. When we write biographies on the Archons, we often refer to them as exarchs in their formative years before stepping into their prime, but officially, Kairos is supposed to grant all titles of the Archons. It's quite the faux pas to self appellate. Exactly why Jade insisted on calling herself Archon of Tides, she didn't need Kairos' approval to wear the title she deserves. And I know she loved the fact that doing so must have annoyed Kairos. How was an icon born or bred? I think we all dream of one day waking up and being an archon. Given some of the madmen and loons that have exhibited mystical greatness, it can seem unfair that the rest of us can't do it. I can say with confidence archons aren't born, they become. Graven Ash is a good study of this. Before he was an archon of war, he was a su successful commander, each victory more daring and glorious than the next. Somewhere along the way, his leadership took on mystical qualities. The Graven Ash we know today can reach out and protect his soldiers from harm. But maybe at first he couldn't just project, he could just protect those near him. I wouldn't know for certain. But all will attest that he didn't have this power his whole life. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since so it doesn't look like I can get him to look at at the, um, at the, um, Silent Archive, unfortunately. Maybe I need to have him in the party? Hmm. I don't know. Let's leave off here. I'll ponder on this. Sweet. Learn a sigil of life. And probably gonna go and find Voices in the Rat and give him the Silent Archive next time.